Today's show is a review of the book art A10, their 10th anniversary speaker. And I got to say right up front that working on this review put me through some serious changes because I thought I knew the book art sound. I mean, last year, I've reviewed a bunch of them, but last year I reviewed the book art uh, S400 Mark II. And I love that speaker. It's sticking around as one of my references. And it has a sound that uh, you know I'm familiar with, right? So I unbox this one, the A10. I set it up. It doesn't sound anything <laughs> like the S400. So I said, well, you know, what is this sound? But here's the thing. The very first thing you notice about the sound of this rather small speaker, it's less than 15 inches tall. Uh, is that it makes an extraordinary amount of bass. But it's not just the quantity of the bass, it is the quality of the bass. It's really fast and clear and tight, extraordinary. And it goes down to, their spec is it goes down to 28 hertz, not even plus or minus 3 dB, plus or minus one and a half dB. So yeah, it goes down. and. In my experience, and I've reviewed a lot of speakers over the years, I've never heard a speaker this small make this much bass, and as I say, really high quality bass. So I was in for quite a ride with the A10. Now, here's the thing. This is an active speaker. It's a powered speaker, and I'm, it's not really an area that I'm all that interested in. Now, I have reviewed other active speakers, recently the Genelec G3, which I did like a lot, and before that, a couple of years ago, the ELAC Navis, which is an active speaker, but one that doesn't use any DSP or electronics. It's purely active, and I like that one. But this one, this is a whole different category of active speaker for me. Now, I will say right up front that most of the people that have been buying uh, Bookart active speakers like the A500 and others, they use them in a wireless setup, a wireless configuration. And I did not use this speaker. Uh, I used it with wires, with a wired connection. So I just want to state that right up front. But the, uh, there is an option to run it wireless. I just chose not to use it that way. Let me take a deep breath here and say, yeah, it looks like a Bookart speaker. It's got that deep waveguide surrounding the tweeter. It's cast aluminum, by the way. And the tweeter is, yes, like the others, a 0.74 inch or 19 millimeter tweeter. But all the other Buckhart speakers, those are uh, soft dome tweeters, fabric tweeters. This one is an aluminum dome tweeter. It's now uh, gaze upon this incredible woofer. It's a six and a half inch paper cone woofer. That's not so incredible, but look at the surround on this woofer. It's kind of a weird shape. Anyway, this woofer is made by another Danish company. It's called Purify. Now this specific version of the woofer is proprietary to Buchart because it has three voice coils. Each voice coil is driven by its own dedicated uh, 50 watt class D amplifier. And a fourth class D amplifier drives that aluminum dome tweeter. This is a, by the way, this is a very expensive woofer because Purify sells the woofer, not this exact model, but a similar model for $439 each. So yeah, they're not fooling around. This is, this is some serious speaker design going on in that woofer. Let's take a look at the A10's rear panel, and uh, there's a bit of an explanation required here, because if you look closely, you'll see that it says, made in Denmark, and then you'll go further down, and you see it says, made in China. <laughs> so what's going on? What's up with that? Okay, so the made in China part means the electronics inside this uh, cabinet are made in China. That's true. Now, but the cabinet itself, which is solid European ash wood, is made in Denmark. In other words, it's not a veneer over MDF. This is a solid wood cabinet. Very, very solid feeling, by the way. And then the driver, the purified driver, is also made in Denmark. 
And the tweeter, which isn't noted on the back side, is actually made in Indonesia. So that's the, that's the full disclosure. Oh, and by the way, the final assembly and QC of the speaker, that takes place in Denmark. Now the speaker comes with a five-year warranty on the speaker itself, and for the electronics, that is a four-year warranty when you register your purchase with Bookart. So as I mentioned earlier, many, most people that buy Bookart's active speakers use them wirelessly. I chose not to, so I only used that analog connection. Inside the speaker, the analog signal is immediately converted to high-res PCM digital, so the speaker's DSP can do its job. So one other really interesting feature of Bukhart active speakers is uh, what they call master tunings, which these are different uh, curves that you can insert into the speaker to change its sound in not subtle ways. You can run the speaker flat, or you can add this other master tuning called warm, which fleshes out the sound, creates a big, rich, full sound. You can do a high pass. There's lots of different options. I think there's 10 different master tunings. They're all free. You can upload them to any uh, USB stick and stick that in that service port and create a new sound from the A10. And I did some of that, of course, later on in this review. Also, next to that USB port, is a sensitivity switch, a slide switch from plus six to minus six to flat, and you can use that to adjust the sensitivity. And the A10 is a sealed box, also known as an acoustic suspension design. So yes, Bukhart is a Danish company. They sell direct worldwide. So the, the prices that they quote are in euros. The current price of the A10 is 3,800 euros. That converts to about $4,000 US. The wireless adapter, which is called the Planton Hub, that sells for 300 euros. So as for setup, I had the speakers on the matching Buchart stands. These are 26 inch tall tripod stands. The preamplifier for all of my uh, listening tests was a Pass Labs XP30. The DAC was a Mola Mola Tembaki. The CD source was the Jay's Lab CDT2. And I was streaming Cobuzz and Tidal through a Blue Sound No 2i. So for my first uh, music choice, I went to this Billie Eilish album because I know it has a lot of bass. So how would this fairly small speaker handle that quantity of bass energy. And I gotta say, it did an amazing job. I'm looking at this speaker, I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at this speaker thinking, it's, this isn't really possible. How could something that small generate that much deep, powerful, yet very clear bass? Then to push it a bit with some raucous rock music, I went with the replacement and I played it pretty loud and the sound was forward and mid-rangey. The bass was, I wouldn't say non-existent, but not a lot of bass. Just this very aggressive in-your-face sound. And then I played this Pretenders album, their second album, which was way better balanced and I love Chrissy Hyde's voice. And man, oh man, these speakers treated her well. And that, that band, the Pretenders, were just so good and so tight and it just brought everything together. And I was, so my point is that every time I changed a recording, I heard a different sound balance from the A10. So in other words, it's not imposing its own sound on the music. If there's a lot of bass in the recording, you hear a lot of bass. If there's very mid-rangey and not much happening on the bottom, you're not gonna hear any bottom. It's not gonna make up stuff that's not there. Now for this next round of listening tests, I wanted to compare the A10 with the passive speaker, with the passive book card, the S400 Mark II. So the front end of the system was exactly the same, the same pass preamp and the J's transport and the Molema, all that was the same, but I added a Pass Labs XA25 power amplifier to drive the S400 Mark II. 
And it was apparent very, very quickly that the A10 was still the more transparent speaker, more inner detail, great clarity, great more top end extension and the treble. All of that absolutely came through and the bass of the A10 went deeper and was tighter and faster than the S400 Mark II. But <laughs> the S400 Mark II was just more at ease, more relaxed, less critical of harsh recordings, bright, edgy, compressed. You know, when I went back and I played the replacements, which is pretty mm, off-putting over the A10, it was much e easier to listen to the replacement over the S400 Mark II. It was less critical of that type of aggressive recording. So different horses for courses kind of thing. It's like, what do you really want? Do you crave maximum transparency? Or maybe you want to pull back a bit from that. That's, that's for you to decide. That's your choice. To continue, I played the original soundtrack from the first go round of Twin Peaks. It's this terrific recording. Uh, Bada Labenti, the composer. Wow, just really, really good stuff. And the A10's soundstage was more specific, more precise, greater sense of depth than the S400 Mark II, absolutely positively. But again, when I returned to the S400 Mark II, I wasn't, I wasn't disappointed. It just has a sweetness and roundness to the sound that I really, really like. So again and again, the A10 proved itself to be a remarkably high resolution speaker that it did very, very well. But when I returned to the S400 Mark II, I just liked it. I just felt more comfortable with that sound. And by the way, it's about half the price of the A10, but of course you have to provide your own power amplifier to that one. Okay, but here's the thing. All of my impressions of the sound up to this point were based on the flat, all flat, master tuning DSP. So I thought, okay, well, I'll stick in the warm master tuning DSP and see what that does. And oh yeah, it definitely changed the sound. It was definitely warmer, fuller, richer, less top end detail clarity that was shelved down. That warmth, that fullness that I crave definitely was pumped up. So that was really good. But even there, I kind of felt like it's, it's a little too warm even for me. And I do like going to the warm side of, of neutral. And then I tried the near field listening DSP, the, the near field listening master tuning. And that was pretty cool. I do like near field listening. And I was sitting about three and a half feet away, about a meter away from the speaker. And I like that a lot. It feels more immersive, like you're inside the sound field, depth, space, all that was really fantastic with the near field DSP. But then <laughs> I actually went back to the all flat DSP and listened again in near field. And you know what? I actually preferred that. So you got you to experiment. That's the point here. The, I, I, I'm so happy that uh, Mads Buchart offers these different choices in, in terms of sound balances of the speaker, and each of us will find our own way. So that's extra cool. And by the way, all these different master tuning DSPs are, are downloads and they're free, so it doesn't cost anything to play around with the sound of the A10. So then I went back to standard listening distance from the speakers, which was about nine feet away and I'm playing this recording by David Chesky. It's called Graffiti Jazz. And uh, it has a lot of bass, a lot of room shaking, very deep bass. And it's gorgeous. And it's, it's not an audiophile recording in the sense of, of capturing real musicians playing in real space. It's not that, it's samples and all that stuff. But the trumpet sound was so cool and the percussive, that detail, that leading edge transient sound was amazing, incredible. Again, from this really small speaker. So I'm playing that recording. Oh, and then I went to something completely different because I like contrast. And I went to this new Bob Dylan record. And this is Bob 
going back to his early songs, but seeing them in a really interesting way. I love this record. This is like one of my favorite, you know, recent Bob Dylan albums by far. He just seems to be exploring this music in really interesting ways, not shouting. He's got, a, again, a different voice than he's used lately. And it's a really well-balanced recording. And the A-10 was letting me hear that really, really well. And I was having a good time because I do, I really love this new Dylan record. Continuing with the music stylings of David Chesky and Bob Dylan, <laughs> not at the same time, I wanted to compare the little A-10 to a floor standing speaker. In this case, the Zoo Dirty Weekend 6. And yet, again, and, and the, the Dirty Weekend 6 has a 10 inch full range driver and a tweeter. And I'm driving that with the uh, XA25 power amplifier. And yes, again, it's a theme here, the A10 made deeper, more powerful, and definitely better defined bass than the Dirty Weekend 6, absolutely. And it was a clearer sounding speaker, the A10 was. But in terms of dynamics, the soft to loud sounds, that, those kind, kind of contrasts, Oh no, <laughs> the Dirty Weekend 6 pulled far ahead of the A10. And when I played, and I could play it louder with ease than I could the A10. So what I'm starting to sense here is, and this was with the David Chesky recording, which isn't dynamically compressed. It's a very live sounding recording. So what, where I'm going here is the A10 is gonna do its best work in small to mid-sized rooms and not played really loud. And if, if, you're, if you fit into that category, this is a speaker and you're looking for an active speaker sound, one that's as flexible as this one is because of its master tuning flexibility, the A10 is definitely a great candidate. And while the A10's bass can reach down to 28 hertz, it's not the same sort of bass you'd get from a true subwoofer. So if that's what you need, you're still gonna to wanna to add a subwoofer to the A10. <laughs> so I think what I just did <laughs> seconds ago was, so Steve, what do you really think of the Bookhart A10 10th anniversary speaker? I think it's an incredible speaker. I'm amazed that something that small could do what it does so well but it's not a universal speaker. I still lean towards the sound of the passive version. The, well, not the passive one, but the passive Bookhart speakers like the S400 Mark II. That's more my speed. But you know, different strokes for different folks. So I'm glad that Bookhart offers both choices to its, to its buyers, and that's fantastic. So anyway, hats off. Again, to, your, to Bookhart's 10th anniversary to Mads Bookhart for being a great guy to talk to on the phone. We have great conversations. And speaking of great, yes, it is now time for the Audiophiliac viewer system of the day. Christian sent in these amazing pictures. His speakers are Bowers and Wilkins 800 D3s that are being vertically biamped. In other words, there's one amp on the woofers and another amp on the mid-range and tweeter. And the amps are Chord Ultima 5. The preamp is a Chord Ultima 2. For digital, there's a Rockna WaveDream Net Server and also a Rockna WaveDream Signature XLR DAC. And for analog, for the analog side of the system is built around a DOS Laughwork turntable with two tone arms and why two cartridges, a Dynavector DVXX2 Mark II, and also a Shoe Audio cartridge. Cables, there's a bunch of cables here. William Tell and also Neotech uh, are providing these speaker cables. XLR, actually XLR uh, interconnects are by Audio Sensibility and also Pink Fawn. And the stands are made by Solid Tech. They are the rack of Silence. Nice going, Christian. All right, we are back. My name's Steve, Steve Guttenberg, AKA The Audiophiliac. Thank you so much for being here and watching my channel.
means a lot to me. Heading ever so slowly towards 250,000 subscribers. Hey, it's just a number. I'll get there eventually. But if you dig the channel, if you like what I'm doing here on the channel with the diversity of reviews and think pieces like the one I did recently on what is your taste in music, what do you think sounds good, and of course reviews and viewer systems of the day and all that stuff and so much more. If you'd like all that or some of it, please consider joining and supporting this channel through Patreon. The address is on the screen right now. Super easy to do. You can join for a month, two months, six months, six years, whatever uh, works for you. I would very much appreciate it. And Patreon accepts payment in dollars, pounds, euros, and pretty much every other currency on planet Earth. With that, I can say my work here is at last complete. Thank you again for watching. And I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.